Hello everyone and welcome to our second joint Charter Banker Institute and Starling Tr Trust Sciences webinar. For those of you who don't know me already, my name is Joe Murphy and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Charter Banker Institute and I'm today's host of what I'm hoping will be both an informative and insightful discussion. This is the second episode in a series of webinars on the topic of banking sector culture and conduct reform. The first episode is available on our YouTube channel should you wish to watch that too. In July last year, my own organisation in partnership with the Starling Trust Sciences compiled a retrospective white paper focusing on the culture and conduct reform efforts over the past decade to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the UK Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards. We'll share that link of the report in the chat function shortly. I'm delighted to have one of the contributors to that white paper joining us today along with three other experts to discuss how standard setting bodies should be approaching banking sector culture and conduct reform across different jurisdictions. I'd now like to introduce my panel, welcoming Miles McGuinness, CEO of the Financial Markets Standards Board, Martin Maloney, Secretary General of ISCO, and Stephen Scott, founder and CEO of Starling Trust Sciences, and my colleague Simon Thompson, the CEO of the Charter Banker Institute and member of the Global Banking Education Standards Board. As a reminder before we commence, we do have a chat function, so if you'd like to post a question, we will try to get through those um, before the end of today's recording. But before we start the discussion, I'd like to just pass over to Stephen. And Stephen, just to ask you, why are we even talking about culture and conduct reform? Why is this topic even worthy of consideration moving 10 years on? Well, thanks very much uh, for the question. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, look, I mean, the report that we did, the 10 year retrospective looking at the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards, I think goes to that question. Um, you know, we had seen a number of banking scandals uh, and they seemed to just be persistent across the industry. And, uh, regulators started asking the question, why is this happening? Is it a failure of systems? Is it a failure of processes? Or is it a more of a human-driven thing? Uh, and starting in around 2012, 2013, with the report that that um, commission produced, uh, we, we sort of saw culture enter the conversation as a topic of regulatory and supervisory interest. And that's persisted, of course. The scandals haven't debated. Um, and um, if we look just at the what is colloquially referred to as the banking sector turmoil of last spring. Uh, we have questions once again around what were the non-financial risk drivers that led to the collapse of these institutions and most particularly Credit Suisse, which uh, the Financial Times uh, put it as they scandalized themselves out of existence. So it was less a financial risk issue. It was more of a risk governance question. Uh, and of course, in, in recent vintage, and this is true in my country, but in others as well, um, government is now asking, the regulators about problems with their own culture. And so the lens that the regulators had brought to the industry is now being turned on the regulators as well. We're about to introduce a report on that ourselves uh, next week. So, so watch for that. We have uh, Wayne Byers, the former chair of APRA, uh, Michelle Bowman, the governor of the Fed, and Charles Randell, the former chair of the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK, all offering their views on this topic. So I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Uh, and I think the consensus is that we haven't fully cracked the nut just yet. Thanks, Stephen. So, Miles, welcome. Thank you. Um, if, if I could just come to you, and you'll be glad that standards aren't going away anytime soon, but can you tell our viewers just a bit about the market standards that your organisations introduced? Yeah, certainly. Thank you. And look, thank you to uh, the Chartered Bankrupt Institute and, and for Starling for, uh, for, for bringing us here. Um, the standards, obviously, uh, incredibly important, and I, I'd echo a lot of what Stephen has said about culture. And how culture, you know, increasingly is at the heart of, um, you know, successful firms. And also, you know, when you drill into failure, um, uh, the lack of good culture can can be found there. But um, if I may, I'd like to remind the audience as to, you know, sort of how and why the Financial Market Standards Board um, came to exist. You all remember the uh, the period post the the financial crisis, and it'd be fair to say that authorities and society generally had lost patience with. The wholesale markets uh, industry generally because of the issues that you saw related to uh, market manipulation, benchmark rigging, um, and, and all the other uh, poor behaviors. And at the time, and this was the, the sort of mid teens, uh, you recall Mark Carney was the governor of the Bank of England. And along with the FCA and HM Treasury, 
they collectively commissioned what was called the Fair and Effective Markets Review. And this report was published in uh, June 2015, and it made 21 individual recommendations, but two of the most important were, one, uh, the creation of the Senior Managers Certification Regime, which was the first accountability regime in the UK, and the second was uh, the incorporation of the FICC Market Standards Board. And that was a name that came to evolve into the Financial Market Standards Board as we started to look outside of um, the limitations of FICC. But briefly, the organization is unique in a number of different ways. Um, it's obviously a non-profit, but it represents all communities that are active in wholesale markets, um, corporates, banks, asset managers, infrastructure providers, pension funds, and most recently, uh, new liquidity providers. And the organization doesn't lobby for any community within its membership. Its purpose is really to improve the fairness and the effectiveness of wholesale markets. Uh, we have strong regulatory ties and we have public advocation from a number of global regulators. And I suppose the four main objectives of the organization are to assist industry always, uh, but to address ambiguities in existing trading practices. So where the rule book may not be specific or where practices um, are literally uh, deviating a little bit away from what is maybe a pre-existing rule and hasn't uh, advanced with technology. We spend a lot of time identifying global market vulnerabilities. Uh, we drive adherence to the standards that we produce and we promote the international convergence uh, to those standards. So, you know, what does a standard look like? Well, the standard is always subordinate to local rules and laws in the first instance, but it there is a guide to industry uh, practitioners. And it's based around core principles and accompanying guidance that address the most important aspects of the practice where ambiguity might risk undermining the fairness, the transparency, and the effectiveness of those markets. And we have an adherence mechanism. So we obligate our members uh, to act in accordance with the standards and to attest every year that they are acting uh, in accordance with those standards and to publish that on their website and also we publish it on our website i'd like to give you an example of um you know a, a notable standard and um, we wrote one in 2021 on the execution of large trades in ficc markets and this is one that martin uh, might also speak to um during the, the podcast it is addressing issues such as uh, pre-hedging, which is um, quite a topical uh, issue at the moment. Uh, ESMA have looked at it and IOSCO have now adopted it into their body of work. And really, this was a, a build on what was um, articulated in the FX Global Code. And it sets out um, to help our practitioners uh, through guidelines as to how to operate um, in large trades and understand the practices uh, that are you know, acceptable within that. But along with standards, um, we also produce statements of good practice. Uh, we're doing a, a revision of one at the minute, which is based around front office supervision. What is a blueprint for very good front office supervision? Now that we have moved on from the crisis and technology plays uh, such a part in the delivery of our business. And we also produce uh, spotlight reviews. And Stephen uh, will be very aware of uh, a couple of these because he spoke about um, Credit Suisse earlier. One of um, our spotlight reviews last summer looked at the efficacy of the three lines of defense model. And that was called into question in the autopsy around Credit Suisse. And a second one, uh, which we produced, and I'm sure we'll probably talk about the, uh, the contents of that as we go forward through the webinar, was around uh, good conduct MI. What constitutes good conduct MI? And how can MI help us, uh, the data sets that our members create? How can it help them uh, deliver better supervision and better outcomes? So certainly, uh, Joanne, we're a big uh, advocate for standards. We do feel that regulators have such a, a wide waterfront um, to police at the minute. They need industry to be proactive and to stand up and actually uh, deliver what are best practice. Th thanks very much, Mills. And I'm sure there's a number of other points we'll come back to, particularly about how do we measure and things like that of, of the standards that are their effectiveness. But if I can just come to Martin, actually, um, Martin, just in a like similar vein, can you give us a bit of an overview of look ISCO and it's how it's involved in standard setting? Sure, no problem, John. And many thanks for inviting me to to join the conversation here. This is an a, an important moment, I think, to be looking at at culture, um, and we as an organisation, ironically 
we originate many years ago in the 1980s in an urge to get a similar culture and similar sets of standard and approaches among regulators across the world as globalization began to take hold and regulators began to realize they needed to do things to similar standards because they were increasingly seeing providers of financial services having bases abroad and they needed to do something about that and initially on the continent of the americas and then globally they moved to try to fix that and the short version of who we are is we are for those of your audience who come from the banking sector we're the sort of the securities markets equivalent of the basel committee and we have just about all the securities market regulators across the globe as, as members. And uh, we have been working on principles and recommended practices for that sector for uh, decades now. A huge portion of our work was concentrated in the period from the late 90s to the early 2000s, where we set up a framework of principles that we thought could underpin globally integrated markets. And subsequent to that, we did a lot of work, obviously, trying to keep that up to date as you get a lot of changes in the marketplace, but also responding to crises and extending our remit to financial stability concerns um, if, uh, after the, the 2008 crash. And that has continued up to the present time. If you look at what we actually produce, at the heart of what we produce is a set of 38 principles, as we call them, for uh, effective financial markets. And that is supplemented by a load of additional recommendations and good practices. And I was very interested in what Miles said, because we can't cover all those details and all those particular areas of practice. And Miles quite rightly says that organizations like his come in, look in detail at particular areas and can supplement the work we do. And I hope in the course of our conversation, that potential for complementarity or even cooperation between global standard setters like ourselves and industry bodies that can help to fill out a good culture for the industry is something that we will really uh, highlight. If you look at what we actually have uh, produced, one of the key things to say about it, and, and this might be a little bit of contrast with sometimes with uh, global standards that are produced elsewhere, is our standards tend to be very outcomes defined. So we, we define what we want, and um, that creates a framework within which jurisdictions can then develop more detailed rules in order to create that outcome, having regard to their particular uh, needs in their locality. One of the interesting byproducts of our work, which I'm not sure it was initially intended all those years ago when we started this work, was firms begin of increasingly, I would say, looked directly to our recommendation, recommended practices and some of the details of our standards in order to guide their own risk management and compliance and control functions internally and developing their own internal cultures. So it's not just as it happens that our work ends up being directed to, uh, to legislators and regulators, but it also ends up being directly uh, addressed to industry, which is a complication at one level, but is a great thing at another level, because some of the detail that we get back from industry in our consultations about how things actually work in the marketplace today, that we then try to feed back into the def definition of good practices. If you could almost skip the level of legislation and regulation and actually people just take them up at an industry level, then that, that's actually hugely beneficial for, for all, all of us. Um, and we're, it's something we're very conscious of as we continue to develop standards in new areas, cutting edge issues at the moment like crypto and sustainable finance and other areas like that that we're, we're currently uh, are working on. We don't have many ex standards explicitly focused on either ethics or culture. I'm aware of kind of one document that we wrote back in, I think it was 2006, uh, explicitly on the on that issue. I would say what our work does more to influence culture is by just setting out what is expected practice, what is good practice in relation to the different areas like market integrity and not manipulating markets in relation to custody of assets and how you value assets for people and value it well, how you deal with situations where you're your investor, your client has significantly inferior information to the amount of information you have and, and therefore potentially could be manipulated, but how you avoid and decline to do that. Uh, all, those are the kind of areas of investor protection and market integrity and increasingly financial stability that we, we tend to work on. And the financial stability one is an interesting one because a lot of our work in that area and our standards are about liquidity management and good liquidity management. 
And there's definitely a tendency, for example, in our industry to manage liquidity to a slightly lower standard than you should. And 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 the fact that we constantly push against that is something that uh, has been a huge theme for us recently and hopefully is underpinning a, a, a stronger culture in the whole sector. Thank you, Martin. And Simon, if I can come to you now, because and, and sort of linking into some of Martin's points there about, you know, individuals, but, but at the Charter Bank Institute, we obviously do look at um, standards at an individual level um, in lines with their appropriate competence, competence to do their job and to work. Um, and the standards mentioned sort of by Miles and, and Martin. So, you know, how do we how do we ensure that individuals do have the, the appropriate levels of competence to work in line with the standards that are being set? Well, I think this is really or one of the keys to 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 embedding standards. I mean, we, we can de develop and publish all the market and technical standards we we like, whether that's in banking, financial services or in the, the wider economy. Um, I think there's something like 25,000 ISO standards alone before we even get to the accounting, the audit, the banking investment standards and things. But if we don't have the appropriately qualified, competent, proficient professional individuals, and that's whether you know, engineers, technicians, scientists, accountants or bankers, then a standard is simply a document that sits on a dusty shelf. Um, so standards are put into practice by, they're endorsed by, they're overseen and enforced by individuals, uh, which implies an appropriate level of, or which requires an appropriate level of relevant technical and professional competence, uh, especially when standards are more principles based as they tend to be in uh, in financial services outcome based uh, as in term, as in the OSCO standards as uh, as Martin just mentioned and then there needs professional judgment based on expertise and experience needs to be exercised in order to apply standards effectively and consistently um, in different sort of cultural geographical and market uh, con contexts um, and of course in many cases I guess the standards themselves are, are, are developed by those to whom they apply certainly in the uh, FSMB and IOSCO cases, the Basel Committee too. Um, so it's, it's relevant expert and experienced market practitioners and specialists um, who develop the standards. Um, and that's another important tool for ensuring they become kind of embedded and uh, become the foundation for our capital markets. But then behind this, therefore, there needs to be an appropriate and relevant technical and professional uh, education to support the adoption, the implementation, the embedding of standards. It's not, it's not, it's not enough just to be a good or well-intentioned individual who wants to ensure positive outcomes for customers, clients, and society, which is usually the end goal for most standards. There needs to be technical and professional competence uh, attained and maintained in order to be able to understand, to work through the implications of particular courses of action, particular uh, uh, behaviors and conduct what the likely outcomes of these might be in order to ensure as you know best we can in a in an uncertain world the, the, the positive outcomes we seek so so it's the role of professional bodies such as ourselves at the chartered banker institute both to codify the values we expect of individuals in our sector which we do via the the chartered banker code of professional conduct so that kind of sets out the good practice we want to see and then to codify the technical and professional competence required by chartered bankers to put those values and ethical principles set out in the code sort of into practice. And just as with other standard setters, we do this by working with expert practitioners to develop those kind of uh, uh, professional education standards. And when you combine a code of conduct with professional education standards, then what you're really doing there is defining, codifying the professional norms for, for your sector, for your profession, setting out the good practice that should exist within and sustain that particular profession at an individual level. You know, in our case, we do that for retail and commercial banking. There's other bodies, so think of CISI, CFA, that will do that for investment banking, CII for insurance, um, and you know, a whole range of accounting, legal risk, and other professional bodies too. And then it's these professional norms, the way we do things around here, that form a really powerful driver of, of purposeful culture and provide you know, one of the defences against uh, against misconduct by creating a more positive esprit de corps um, with professional and perhaps social penalties for for transgression um so certainly as uh, as well as supporting the implementation of, of sort of market and technical standards i think the work of professional educators like ourselves supports broader market integrity and helps ensure the safety and stability of institutions and the financial system overall. So I, I would certainly like to see supervisors, regulators taking a much closer interest in this you know, than they do at the moment and actually looking globally at issues of 
professional education and standards there for for bankers you know just as they just as they do with the market standards such as the fsmb and uh, iosco so just th- thanks for that simon and and i suppose building on that point then um Stephen, if i can come back to you so how strongly do formal standards and standard guidelines actually impact an employee's behavior um and and are there actually informal standards out out there and what can we do to align those yeah thanks for the question joe i, I want if i may i want to i want to take a step back in order to get a running start at how i'd answer that question and and yeah. if, if i may first just congratulate uh, all of us on this call. I hadn't thought about it like this before, but what we've seen in the industry, and I hear I'm speaking about the banking sector, which is the area that we um, we focus on, uh, over the last 15 years, is an, an increasing, an increasingly common perspective among banking sector regulators, uh, and this is true in other industries as well, um, that culture is a thing, that it's important, that it shapes the behavior of, of the people in an organization. It therefore shapes the performance of those organizations. It shapes the impact for the stakeholders of those organizations. And, and gosh, if that's all true, then we, the, the, the regulatory and supervisory community, we really ought to do something about it. Now, they haven't really known what that something is. And the posture that they've adopted is, is well, it's not really for us to figure this out. We're, we're just going to say we think it's important, and we're going to urge industry to suss it out. It's not for us to be prescriptive around these issues. It's for industry to figure it out. And then, of course, there's as many different opinions on this topic in industry as there are participants in the industry. And so it's been very, very muddy. And there's been a lot of uh, frustration. This is important. What do you want us to do about it? We're not sure. You figure it out. What will you find credible and compelling? Asks the industry. We're not sure. We'll let you know when we see it, say the regulators. And into the middle of that comes an event like this, which I think is really important because here you have... IOSCO, right, a standard setting body for for, uh, markets. You have the FMSB, a standard setting body for industry. And you have the CBI, a standard setting body for professionals, all coming together. And I haven't seen this happen uh, before. Uh, All coming together to say, right, let's us come together and try to suss it out. Now, Starling, we're a technology company. We build technology tools that firms use to manage these sorts of non-financial risks. But in the process of trying to explore that, we started asking ourselves, well, why is nothing being done in a comprehensive, coherent, consistent manner across the industry? And it's for precisely this issue. And one of the things that we would emphasize to come to your question more pointedly is that standards, and you'll you'll hear regulators and and others on on boards will talk about the importance of the tone from the top. Um, We push back against that. Uh, I've used the metaphor, the tone from the top is the speed limit sign on the side of the highway. Uh, if it says 50 miles per hour, but all the cars around me are doing 65, I'm pretty sure that I and most others will be driving in around 63 to 72 miles an hour. We're, we're not going to follow the speed limit sign. We may not even be aware of what the speed limit sign says. We take our behavioral cues from the peers around us. So while it's important to create standards, it's also important to figure out how you're going to affect those standards. And affecting standards in an organizational context is a bottom-up phenomenon, far more so than a top-down phenomenon. And it tends to be talked about in a top-down manner. And so we've tried to come in and emphasize the fact that that's really not how human beings work. And I'll just offer an anecdote in closing. When John Stumpf, who at the time was the CEO of Wells Fargo, uh, when their their, um, false selling scandal erupted, he was, uh, right before he appeared before the U.S. Senate to explain himself and his organization, he appeared on a chat show here in the U.S., and the host basically asked, "Why in God's name would would employees have done this? I mean, it's 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 illegal. They know that it's wrong, and they weren't going to be making very much money." Uh, and Mr. Stump threw his hands in the air and he said, "I can't explain human behavior." And while I think that people in a lot of C-suites would understand that frustration, the fact is he was overseeing an organization made up of two hundred seventy thousand people. So if you don't understand what drives their behavior, then how do you really affect your job well? Uh, and in his case, the Congress and the industry felt that he he hadn't, right? So so I think it's a, a real problem that needs to be sorted. And I think it's bodies like those on this call that will figure it out. Thank you, Stephen, for that. Um, 
Miles, can I, can I just bring you back in here? So, because, and, and I think I was really thoughtful about it because when you were repeating like how many, or I think what Stan, Simon was saying, how many standards are created and you've got different organisations and, and banks are very wide themselves and, and look at all different functions. So it's just massive when you consider it as a, a total. But, but so I suppose that, that that part answers my question about like why, why, why are standards of conduct and culture so complex to implement? Um, and, and why is it important that, you know, the security regulators and market par participants care about trying to improve the culture and conduct in the industry? Well, look, I would agree with um, with what's been said that, um, you know, standards are an important and increasingly important mechanic in um, sort of making sure that uh, we retain uh, and uh, build integrity in markets and that we have fair and effective markets. Um, I think standards um, are important increasingly because, you know, from our perspective, they're industry led, right? So we have practitioners who come together in working groups and actually describe the situations that they're facing and um, read the rule book, try and interpret uh, recent events, cognizant of the rule book and write down a sort of code of practice for what is best practice uh, going forward. And because of the regulatory relationships that we have, uh, the, we have observance of that debate uh, from regulators. So you get the sort of a holistic um, view that um, understands that on the one side, what a regulator is trying to achieve, understanding on the other side, what industry is trying to deliver um, with the various constraints it has. And here I, I'll invoke uh, that these are, my, uh, these are my own opinions and not necessarily shared by all the members, but I do think personal accountability regimes are really important. They've brought to mind and um, to the forefront of a supervisor's mind that they do need to, 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 to Stephen's point, manage that messaging. That is not just enough to sort of, you know, pay homage to the tone from the top, yeah, whatever, and go and do something completely different. And, you know, I've often, um, and I think I said it in the, in the preamble call that we had, um, you know, where I get really um, concerned about is the permafrost in the middle. Right, they you know the top tend to say something tends to be echoed with the juniors because the juniors have been they've had a lot of exposure through graduate induction and through sort of continuous learning. But it's the it's the piece in the middle, the um, you know, the, the mature VPs and directors and junior managing directors who are you know in the banking industry who are driving uh, the, the PL and delivery weighs very heavily on them. How do you ensure that they stay on message, that they make the right decision? And at the right time, faced with a number of different options. And that's culture, right? That is really, if you have a good culture, then arguably they will know which, uh, which way to go. And I think that's what we have to collectively come together as, right? To, so to Stephen Point, we have a technologist here, you have an industry body here, and you have Martin representing um, a community of regulators. We all want the same thing, um, but it's ensuring that that messaging within our member firms and wider in the industry and um, is consistent and um, that is a cultural thing and you know that that's where i think senior managers have really improved because i think in the as we were forming martin did say it was important to recognize that industry has improved right it's certainly not there because we continue to see outages we continue to see uh, censures there's certainly an awareness that there is more to be done and you'll never be fully there anybody that says you are is probably a red flag in itself but it's the, the culture journey and trying to build a robust, inclusive culture that will make you better. And that when you make a mistake, you have the courage to be able to stand up and say, I made a mistake. Um, and that it gets unwound and you feel protected. Um, and that's, I think, what we, um, what we all need to strive for. Martin, could I just bring you in here, just like building on that question? Like, what's your view and on, on this sort of complexity of, of, of from a cultural perspective and the consequences if we feel to yeah i mean one of the things you've got to say i think uh, uh, in this context is there's a there's a silence on 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 one topic out there and we need to 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 i think call it out which is this i have no doubt every single day in companies all over the world the effective operation of culture prevents harm being done and rules being broken and we're talking about the opposite here but you've got to acknowledge that because it doesn't happen loudly it happens qu quietly in fact it happens silently 
some guy working in some company comes up with some great idea for a scam that allows him to his company to trade off their clients, let's say. But he thinks no one in here is going to buy that uh, and they're not going to do it. So I'm just going to keep it to myself. So no one knows that happened. No one knows maybe that he made the suggestion to the to the person up the line and he or she said, no, that's not the way we work here. And uh, he got to wrap down and went away. But that's a really important fact that we all need to understand. If that were not the case, the avalanche of constant, endless breaches of regulatory room, rules would be such that not only would I have a job for life, but I'd have a job for multiple lives. And many other people have jobs in regulation uh, as well, because there would be no way to control an industry as complex as this if there were not a substantial positive culture in large parts of the industry. And I've no doubt that's down to the work of people like Miles and Simon and others and so on, and, and Stephen, and just, just making this work and building the, the bricks uh, uh, of, the, of the system at, at, at every level. Okay, that said, then we're now trying to deal with a situation in which that didn't work. And we're asking ourselves, well, is that becoming more important than it used to be? And without a doubt, it is becoming more important than it used to be because the financial system is becoming more complex and the vulnerability of the end user and end consumer in the face of the system is becoming more uh, intense. So the more and more that you get these uh, rules and requirements and standards of behavior being breached, the more and more potential for, for harm to be done. And for example, when you see an area like crypto where with all due respect to them, the culture was not good for a very long time. You see an awful lot of uh, 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 decent people losing a lot of money very quickly, in, in even though it was actually quite a small small field. And that gives you a sense of what things are, uh, are like when things go, go seriously wrong. And I think for us as, a, as an industry and a sector, um, the heart of this is the ability to move from a compliance culture to a, a what I might call a reasonableness culture and from a reasonableness culture to a care culture. And that ladder is very hard for, for, for some parts of our, our industry to get up, uh, uh, to get up that ladder to a better place culturally. And if you ask yourself, why is it so hard? I really agree with the points that were made earlier about middle management, and they've been absolutely crucial. Because if you go off and read the, any of the anthropological literature, the sociology literature, that all our conversation about culture is actually influenced by, even though many of us in the financial sector don't particularly focus on that, the core of what they think culture is, is they think it's about learned behaviors and it's about narratives. It's about stories we tell each other and how those stories educate our colleagues, our friends. So Miles teaches me a certain way of doing a thing. I teach Simon, Simon teach Stephen. And by the time Stephen teaches Joanne, it's hallowed with history and it's not supposed to be varied. And if that's a low standard, then it's going to be really difficult for, 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 for Joanne to, to do anything else but do what has been done and dictated by, by the people uh, before. And that is why this is so difficult to change. And I honestly can't say that I have a, a, a magic wand that can change it. We had a good example, I thought, recently in relation to greenwashing, where we actually thought here in IOSCO, OK, there's a huge problem of greenwashing. We have to fix it. So we're going off to do a fundamental fix to restructure the market. Meanwhile, we've got a period of years where people are not being well treated and handled. So what did we do? We turned to industry and we said, that we need you, your voices, to begin to be raised in this, to try to change the culture, to hold the line against this pressure. And we recognized it was a commercial pressure towards greenwashing to hold the line against it. Was that 100% successful? Probably not, in my personal opinion, but it was a little bit successful. We did get some response, and some of that response was positive. And it is notable that by a combination of different actions, regulators inspecting more closely, issuing more codes, industry organizations saying this is the standard of good behavior and so on, you start to get a chorus of voices that mean that we are actually today not facing it, in my opinion, as intense a, a, a greenwashing phenomenon as we were facing a couple of years ago. And that's cultural shift. And there's no simple clue to it to how to get it right i think it takes a lot of different voices speaking with a similar theme and tone to to actually influence uh, uh people but i do one last point if i may just before i finish i am quite suspicious 
about this idea of tone from the top. And I think there was a bit of suspicion uh, uh, or skepticism about it articulated earlier. The reason why I'm suspicious about it is I think it's a little bit like the rotten apples theory of, of somebody breaking rules. You know, you whenever somebody breaks a rule in a particular uh, uh, organization or sector, there's always a tendency to say, well, the sector's fine, but he was just, you know, he was the rotten apple in the barrel and he's the problem. And sometimes I think in our culture debates, we kind of do the same thing in relation to chief executives. Now, maybe sometimes it's true, but sometimes we, we do that as well. I am a strong believer in both the culture of sectors as well as the culture of firms and the cultures of financial centers as well as the cultures of sectors. And all those things influence culturally in really important ways. So in my opinion, not only should uh, firms look to their culture, but particular financial centers, there are many financial centers around the world should look to their cultures. And by the way, organizations like Simon's can be really important in determining the culture of, of financial centers because professional ethics and the promotion of professional standards and recognizing professional exams can really be an important feature of getting promoted and having a good career in a particular financial center. But if embedded in that is a set of high standards that are being constantly rolled out to people, that's a really positive way in which the ecosystem of a financial center can be culturally influential. And in the same way, sectors have to be honest about where their own culture is on that spectrum, compliance versus reasonable treatment versus actual care for your, for your clients. And that's a tough thing, I think, for sectors to tell themselves the truth about. Thanks, Martin. Yeah. Joe, if I, if, I, if I may, I, yeah. could I, yeah. I would like to sort of, to sort of um, challenge politely on the, the tone from the top uh, point, if I, if, if, if I may. Um, I, mean, I certainly don't, don't disagree that we need to look at uh, building culture and professional standards and uh, social, professional and social norms from the bottom up as, 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 as well. Um, but it does seem to me if these are not shared and are not role modeled by those at the top, then they can very quickly fall apart. And, uh, you know, I mean, Stephen's metaphor of um you know tone from the top being similar to a speed limit sign i i was just reflecting on that and i wonder whether actually isn't 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 the ceo or the board member less of a speed limit sign and more like a mercedes at the front of a line of traffic you know they can choose how quickly they drive it in my case i've probably got a caravan behind the car so i'm not going all that quickly at all but you know others others might have a ferrari or something um and then when we think about that that's a broad view of culture and conduct and especially tone at the top I think actually we, we we should recognize that you know the issues of misconduct or perceived misconduct are by no means limited to, to banking and financial service. I mean, just think of Boeing at the moment, the post office in the UK and more. And we should also recognize and celebrate the very significant progress we've made in financial services because things have got a lot better and there's you know reasonable evidence um to uh, to suggest that, at least in, in, in some areas. But perhaps there's maybe a general perception that in business and public life. Um, in some cases, perhaps, perhaps, I mean, it, it, in some cases, the broadly accepted standards of conduct and behavior, the Nolan principles, accountability, responsibility, honesty, seem to be absent. So perhaps we need, uh, I think, Miles, you introduced, uh, uh, you know, personal accountability regimes to the discussion, you know, perhaps we need those more widely, not just in financial services. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to get away from having kind of one rule for the, the elites and another for the rest standards of conduct and ethics need to be consistent for all and tone from the top is key because that's what very often sets the narrative and reinforces the narrative and where the stories come from that really set the the, the culture that martin was talking about so simon uh, th mm. thanks for raising that point i'm actually going to come to stephen because stephen from a behavioral science perspective you know about how we act and how we're influenced and whether is, is it the tone from the top is it the bottom is it the permafrost in the middle what makes us behave the way that we behave? Yeah, so I think the answer is D, all the above. Um, and uh, and I certainly got my money's worth from this conversation just listening to my fellow panelists for the last several minutes. So um, so there's this question of the tone from the top, and then I think um, Miles was was dead right in saying you get an echo from the bottom. Um, the problem is the muddle in the middle. And uh, that problem, I, I, I think Martin put it beautifully, is, is a problem of what is the narrative? Um, and to Simon's point, you know, the, the, the tone from the top may be very, very sincere. I think John Stump, to come back to him as an example, 
Um, I, I don't know him, but he certainly strikes me as a fairly Jimmy Stewart-esque kind of a figure. And I think that he was probably very sincere when he said, we tried to impart the right tone from the top, but you know, we just had some bad, bad apples. Uh, that argument didn't prevail in the court of public opinion. And I think the issue was that muddle in the middle, the narrative in the middle of the organization that was the day-to-day -day reality for the people who populate the middle of the organization was not something that the people at the top understood to be the narrative at the middle. And I think that these accountability regimes, if they steer us towards anything, it's to an appreciation of that. If you set the tone from the top in the way that you think is right, and you're checking with your juniors when you do your, your testing and your professional standards development and your online ethics training and things of that sort, and you ticked all those boxes and everything looks great, how did this go awry? And it went awry because the muddle in the middle was not appreciated, was not understood, was not investigated well. And I think that the frustration around that is, well, how the blazes are we meant to do that? And I think that is a fundamental challenge that the industry needs to address. I don't think there's a silver bullet answer to that question. I think some of it is around standard setting. Some of it is around training. Some of it is around all the traditional things that we do to manage these risks in organization. It's not our point as a, a technology company offering something is to say, well, we've got it all figured out. Rather, we're saying there is a piece of the puzzle here that's very, very poorly understood. We don't have a brilliant means of investigating. And this is true, of course, at Boeing, at VW, at Rio Tinto. I mean, we have a long list of, of where culture and organizations have resulted in huge problems. So this is a problem that's shared across industries. And participants at all levels in those industries have a, a common interest in trying to resolve those answers. The tools that we throw at it, more rules, more regulations, more, more training, those, those tools are all important, but collectively insufficient. So there is something missing. We think that technology is a part of that solution, but it's a part of it, not all of it. And it's understanding the different dynamics that this group is discussing that I think really educate technologists and others who are trying to solve these problems to where they really need to focus their attention and their energies. So there, Thanks, there is, Nick. if I could also, John, if I could just build on that point a little bit, there is one issue which besets the industry we're in, and it's short-termism. So we have quarterly, semi-annually, and annual targets. And we all know the passage of time. <laughs> we're already in February. It's, um, you know, you're, you're nearly, you're nearly halfway through your first quarter. So a lot of what you want, the, the behaviors that you want to instill are intuitively long-term behaviors. They come up under constant pressure every quarter to try and drive revenues and drive returns. And I think when we look at this in a holistic way, we have to sort of take that into account. Can we change uh, long-term reporting periods? You look at success stories outside of financial industry, right? You, you look at corporates of which, you know, a lot of corporates lead some of this uh, thought process in our organization because they've got a different view. They can take much longer views as to, you know, their placement in market, uh, the building up of their brand, Boeing obviously really Boeing as an exception. But, you know, I'm thinking about understanding long-term value. And that is very consistent and complementary to building up long-term culture that delivers that sense of purpose. In financial services, we're beset with short-termism. And short-termism sometimes is a very uncomfortable bedfellow for long-term culture development. And you know, I, I think we just need to be honest about that. Do you think though that do you think that means though that we also need to be honest and accept that that there will be feelings because something that you've all spoken about, because you've got short-termism, but we're also in this environment where technology is changing all the time, the dynamics universally is changing constantly. Do we just need to get comfortable with the fact that? there's always going to be feelings. We're always going to be on a learning cycle. I'll maybe come to Martin for that one. So um, I am impressed. Uh, we talked about Boeing and the airplane construction business, but I'm sometimes impressed by the way um, health and safety regulation operates in the airline sector. And in particular, They've achieved something which, for example, and I'm no expert on either, so I observe just as a, as a citizen watching from the sidelines, um, they've achieved something which I think, for example, the health sector does not seem to have achieved, which is the ability to call out failings without getting into a blame cycle. And this seems to be very uh, important. 
in order to develop a culture in which uh, failings get called out. And I wonder myself whether we can um, get to where we want to be in relation to financial services unless we can do that. And one of the scenarios which is most challenging is an organization where senior executives uh, talk the right talk, but then when you get people down in that permafrost in the middle who take a short-term perspective and who deliver results by methods that should not be uh, disclosed in public, um, then what happens? And the truth is, in a number of organizations, what happens is they get the bonus and they go home and everything feels good from their point of view. And all their colleagues note that. And so that becomes one of those narratives that I was talking about earlier. So this is a place where we say X and we do Y. And if you... Um, if you then say, okay, so we don't want to say X and do Y, so what are we going to do? We're going to find the people who do the wrong thing and hit them over the head. Then you get into, into a space of, no, you're not actually going to find them if you do, if you, if you do that. You, you get, so you need to get into this space where you're getting the right tone from the top. You're getting the follow through in a constructive way where as a team, as a group, as an organization, you're trying to get to a better place. There's something around that kind of corporate culture that, that one needs to, uh, to have. And closely related to that, I would say, one of the things I sometimes worry about when supervisors and regulators do get interested in this, one of the traps I suspect they fall into sometimes is they develop metrics. So you go in and you, let's say, you, do an ob you observe senior meetings in an organization. And by the way, not many regulators do this, but some do. And you count. And you see how many times different speak, uh, different people speak, and you see who speaks and so on. And then you present that back to the firm and you say, you've got a very hierarchical culture. You were a room of 20 people there and only two people did all the talking, uh, you know, in this simple example. So what happens in that scenario then is the organization is told, next time we come back, I need to see more people speaking in the meetings. So the measurement becomes the goal instead of actually the goal becoming just a risk indicator of what might be troubling in the culture of the organization. So I'd like to say uh, that supervisors getting in there can help to be part of the solution by observing culture and feeding it back into organizations. But somehow they need to do it without falling into this, if you pardon the phrase, this blame culture, where everything then just descends into let's all call the lawyers. Because uh, that's not helping us either get out of this. Martin, just building on your point and that sort of when you're saying about the voices in the room, is there a role for diversity and inclusion within this as well? Absolutely. I, I mean, personally, one of the things I've always said about diversity and inclusion, because some people will say back to you, why as a regulator do you care about diversity and inclusion? And my answer back to them is, is if you have an organization where the recruitment processes are creating and the, the promotion processes are creating distorted outcomes as you go up the pyramidal hierarchy, then that tells you something about what kind of organization you're working in, in terms of the messages it sends out to people within its organization as to who gets promoted, why you get promoted. And that and 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 the the way to 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 tackle that is to use diversity metrics as an indicator that there might that there's a cultural issue but if you then turn the diversity metrics into the only game in town and you just want to tick the box and the diversity metrics you're back to square one you haven't actually engaged with the cultural question which is the heart of how a complex group of thousands of people actually work together and create all these stories for each other and then either improve or diminish each other's behavior thank you so much for that martin simon can i just bring you in here so heard lots about why we're falling short but I suppose where and why are we falling short when it comes to st setting standards for conduct and ethics um well so one one area I'm um, interested in Martin's point about um airlines and again I come at this as well as a as a citizen and a and a, and a frequent flyer rather than any particular expert um but I've just been some trying to mull that point over and I I do wonder whether whether maybe one of the differences between sort of airline safety and this is thinking about the airlines here and sort of pilots, not not Boeing versus Airbus. I think there's a whole different story going on there, and that's somebody else is doing that webcast. I'm sure as we're recording this one, um, the again, it, you know, each airlines don't compete in terms of their culture of safety. You know, all airlines aim to be 100 percent safe, and pilots and airlines share 
uh, and engineers share information when something goes wrong and the sort of psychological safety across the whole of the sector as i understand it at least in financial services it seems to me we look at this at the level of firms uh, and certainly regulators and supervisors do that firms compete on their culture and say we have a better culture than you and i don't think you see that so much at least i, I that's my impression within airlines so so there's a, a loyalty to something a sense of belonging to something that's much bigger than your firm you know you are a you're a pilot you are part of the aviation sector and profession and and that's really what i think that i think that is lacking within within banking and financial services and if you're loyalty and this free decor is only to your firm then you probably end up with a much more kind of incentive driven and the narratives are, are, are very different from a from a from a sector profession wide narrative so that's that's maybe one reason why i think we might find it uh, find it challenging um secondly i think um one another issue we face and other, other professions face this too would be whether you know, whether we're seeking to judge conduct and ethics by assessing values and behaviors or rather the outcomes of those you know we should aim for the former but that's like trying to it's very 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 hard to do that they're very hard by their nature to assess and codify so we often end up and certainly you know regulators and supervisors are setting standards that in their view lead to good outcomes for for customers clients you know patients in the medical profession or, or, or other users of our services and the difficulty here comes when the outcomes today or tomorrow uh, uh couldn't reasonably have been foreseen 10 or 20 years in the past when decisions were taken which leads to a fear of innovation in case the future you know it, the future is then read or future outcomes are redefined as poor conduct so you haven't really got some of the psychological safety that actually i think seems to be the case in in places like sort of uh, uh airlines i think there's also something about the way the structure of banking has changed over the past decades um but that in terms of, i mean the the, the career structure, the days of young women and men joining a bank when they left school, having a career for life, learning from those who've gone before, who, who you know, and having the war stories, the narratives, inculcating the professional norms. You know, that's that's gone now, at least in most developed Western kind of capital markets. Labor is extremely mobile. Um, people move not just between uh, financial institutions, but between sectors. So many people don't see themselves as being bankers, but they might be a technologist or a mar marketeer or a legal specialist who works in banking for a few years, and then they go off to work in Amazon or Google for a few years and then somewhere else. So I think this makes it quite hard to develop and embed the professional and social norms, uh, because the, the the role models, the learning, the narratives, the consistent narratives uh, sim simply aren't uh, there. And, and actually, probably, probably related to that, in too many cases, it's too easy to move within the financial services sector or between sectors uh, without sanction if sort of conduct rules are, are, are broken. Yeah, well, um, so I think it's going to be very hard to put the genie, we're not going to put the genie back in that particular bottle. We're not going to go back to an old fashioned sort of model of, of banking career structures, but we probably need to find other ways to recreate a similar sense of belonging to the banking profession um, and the sort of supporting professional and cultural norms um, that we would that we'd like to see. Thank, thanks, Simon. Um, I'm just conscious of time, so it's probably maybe last question, maybe that I can um, put to the panel. But but maybe Stephen, can I just maybe come to you because um, you know, in the the UK and in the US just now, you know, the regulators themselves are also under scrutiny. And do you think that that regulators are holding themselves to different conduct standards than than the industry? Well, so with 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 respect to my friends in the regulatory world, I think that there is a broad perception, um, perhaps unspoken. You know, if we're if we're not in a profit seeking enterprise, if we're working for government to protect the interests of society more broadly, um, we're de facto good, and, um, and and therefore we don't necessarily need to be scrutinized in the same way as you know the the greedy profit seeking players in the market might need to be scrutinized. And I think that that is something that's worth testing. Um, it's certainly being tested in this country and in the UK and elsewhere uh, currently. And again, we have a report on precisely this issue that's coming out uh, next week. So I, I'd ask people to watch for that. We have uh, entitled it very cleverly, Physician Heal Thyself. Um, before you start telling us how to get our house in order, maybe you should demonstrate that you have your own house in order. So I think we're gonna see more of that going forward. And frankly, I think it's a good development 
Um, I just want to underscore once again something that 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 Martin offered. Um, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. We've all heard that that aphorism. Um, but it's also very easy to start gaming the metric. So we don't necessarily want there to be no metrics around this, but we want there to be effective metrics. And if the regulators are now having their feet held to the fire around the same issues that they've been um, accosting the industry about, maybe there's an opportunity for a public-private sort of uh, uh, collective action around deciding what good looks like in this context. What are the right metrics? How do we establish that and put them into practice in a way that is practicable in a way that is not utopian or panglossic, right? How can we how can we actually put effective metrics in place, and how can we jointly work to create those? Um, I'll just offer this in closing. When when the Chernobyl disaster took place, um, participants in the nuclear industry were competitors with one another. They didn't do a lot of information sharing. Um, after that disaster, there was a dramatic cultural change in the industry globally, and it involved private sector players government entities all coming together saying, we have a collective interest in making sure that this never happens again. And it created a cultural predisposition across all the different participants in the industry to share best information and to share information to the point that Miles raised earlier. We had an error. I mean, thank God it didn't turn into a disaster, but we want to be completely transparent. We blew it. Let's make sure that none of the rest of us suffer the same problem because it's disastrous for all of us should that take place. And I think that's the kind of phenomenon that, that organizations like the CBI, like IOSCO, like the FMSB, and we hope that we ourselves can play a part in trying to promote that kind of an industry dialogue. And maybe today's call is an example of that. Thank, thank you so much. Um, with that, I'd just like to thank all of our panelists because we're out of time and we probably could have lasted another hour. But two little things to see just from our audience today. And thanks for the comments that came in. And Robert Sister just raised a point really about like, standards are mostly outcome based, but perhaps there needs to be a greater focus on ethics and how we instill a sense of duty and not just consequence. Um, across the profession and then one of our other um, audience members had, had raised about that perhaps there was too much softer in-house values than standards and potentially more precedent had to be given to holding professional qualifications and codes of standards of conduct and ethics to make sure the industry was more aligned so, so that was a couple of comments that came in so thank you so much to our audience for listening today to Simon Miles Martin and Stephen for participating. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's webcast. Um, it will be available um, on our YouTube channel shortly. If you'd like to pick up on any of the points or hear it again, you can also share that with others if you think that your peers could learn um, from the information and the insight. Um, and our next episode um, will be coming out soon. So just watch out for that. But in the meantime, thank you so much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye for now. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.